Now, when you read this, that Christ has left us an example that we should follow in his steps, that's pretty obvious what he's talking about. We need to, to go along in the same path, same direction, the same way of living that Jesus did. Luke tells us that uh, in Acts 1, that uh, he wrote about all the things that Jesus began both to do and teach. The things Jesus did, the things that are recorded in the scripture, they're for us. He was the master teacher. He taught, certainly taught by example, and, and he knew the value of an example. The scripture tells us to follow examples. Like Paul said, follow me or imitate me even as I imitate uh, the Christ, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. We should also, though, be very careful about the kinds of examples we choose to follow. I remember one time a fellow was uh, describing himself. He said, well, I tell you what, I'm, one thing I'm good at, I'm a good, bad example. Well, we don't need those. And if they're there, we don't need to follow them, that's for sure. And so be careful the f examples that we follow. Not everyone sets the kind of example that one should follow. We can be sure that Jesus has given us a perfect example. Uh, the ve next verse after the one we just read a moment ago, I believe it's verse 22, says, He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Jesus was the perfect, sinless Son of God, the Lamb of God, sinless Lamb of God. And we can be sure that Jesus has given us a perfect example. And so we, if we would follow in his steps, that'll lead us to right paths of righteousness, lead us to eternal life, and that's what we should seek to do. Now, Jesus said, learn of me, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. And we do need to observe him. There's one thing if I don't forget to do tonight, I want to uh, share something with you that I find very interesting. But in this series of lessons, it'll be our purpose to study some of the things Jesus taught by example and how his example can help us be more like him. Christians, you're to follow the example of those who have the rule over you. Now, I squirmed a little bit when I was getting to this point because we who have the rule have the authority as elders over the church, uh, have an extra dose of responsibility because the church is told to imitate our faith. That means our faith better be right on, spot on, and all, always, all the time. And I, I'm not fussing at the elders. I told them I was going to, but I'm really not fussing because I are one. I'm just saying, I know that's not good grammar, but I know that we have a keen responsibility. If I want you to imitate my faith, my faith better be exhibited, it better be very clear, better be obvious what I believe, why I believe, and I better be able to give an answer to any man that ask me the reason concerning the hope that is within me, yet with meekness and fear. I need to be that kind of example. But it's not just the elders that need to be setting a good example. Every one of us ought to be setting the good example uh, for others. Christians, we need to be uh, like the Thessalonians, they, they were exhorted to follow Paul's example. Paul had left them a good example. He had done right before them. And they were aware of what he had done. We're not to follow the bad example. For example, of the Israelites, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 has a, several verses there. Don't do like they did here. Don't do like this. Don't do that. And it's a really clear that they were a good bad example. And we don't want to follow that. Now, some of the exhortations in the scripture to follow examples are very obvious. Others may not be. I want you to look with me at Philippians 4, 9 right now. There are four real points in there, if I'm remembering correctly. Philippians 4, 9. In there... Paul tells the Philippians, after he told them what to think about, he says, the things which ye have both learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do. And then he adds the promise that the God of peace shall be with you. And so what did Paul tell them to follow? 
the things they had learned and received, and you may want to lump those together, that's fine, but heard and saw in him. I, I can only imagine that the Apostle Paul, not only did he teach them, he made sure they were recipients of that teaching, but he also would say things maybe not in the specific teaching situation, and they could observe his life because he was right there with them. And he did things that he was not even required to do. He could have taken advantage and received benefits or support from the church, but he worked day and night supporting himself just so he wouldn't be a burden, just so he could be a good example. And we have a responsibility to take the admonition that Paul gave the brethren at Philippi. Now, look with me at some other scriptures uh, where encouragement was given to follow the example of another. Uh, who would look up Ephesians 5, 1? Charlie, would you do that? I'll pick on you. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. And then if you would read that aloud, I know that we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. We want to be followers of God, the almighty creator. This is something that seems to frustrate people, like in the matter of holiness. God's holy, and we're to be holy like God is holy, and that just, it's the same thing here. How can we be like God? Well, there are a number of his characteristics, obviously, we can't imitate. But there are a number of God's uh, characteristics, or attributes, I should say, that we can imitate. Love, kindness, compassion, et cetera, et cetera. And so if we're going to imitate God, then we will be, uh, we'll be doing a good thing. That's, uh, that's the, we need to be encouraged to follow the example or imitate God. All right, someone else, let's see. I've already mentioned 1 Corinthians 11. One, Alan Clements, would you look at 1 Corinthians 11, one, please, sir? And read it aloud. Now, Christ was deity, wasn't he? So Christ was God, God the Son. And so Paul's saying, imitate God, yes. Now he's saying, imitate me as I imitate deity, as I imitate the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. That's a really powerful message, isn't it? Pretty potent for us. Imitators of Paul would have been right on, wouldn't they? Because he was doing a jam up good job of imitating the Lord Jesus Christ, I think. From everything we know about him, he was doing a great, now he wasn't perfect, but he did a lot of good things. What about Philippians 3, verse 17? What does that say? Very similar. Brethren, be ye imitators together of me. Mark them that uh, so walk even as ye have us for an example. We need to be we need to be, if we're admonished this many times in Scripture, to follow the good example of Paul, of God, of the Lord Jesus, then I think it's pretty important. What about 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6? What does that say? Ye became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. You became imitators of us. You followed our example. You imitated us. You imitated the Lord. And that's, uh, I, there's several more. Steve, what would you say about the, the 11th chapter of Hebrews? Are there any, you don't have to read it. Just, you know what it's about. What do you think about those examples? You about can't beat them, can you? Um, faith was the only thing that yeah, yeah, that's good. We've got a example after example, Hall of Fame, as he put it. And all of those people, by faith, they did this in obedience to God. Is there any better examples than those? I don't think so. And I think we can do that, and I think we can follow their example. I, I want to spend a minute on 1 Timothy 4.12, if you want to turn over there with me. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, the apostle Paul tells Timothy, 
Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an ensample or example to them that believe in word, in manner of life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, I'm going to bring that up again down here at the bottom of the page, I realize, but I want to get off on this for just a minute because I think it's so important. He's saying to Timothy, you need to be reflecting Christ in your life in every aspect of your life. You need to be striving to set the kind of example uh, to those who are believers, those who are Christians, or even those who might become believers. In everything you say and how you live your life, in the ex- uh, exhibiting of your love towards your fellow man, uh, what else? In your faith, in your total trust in God, dependency upon Him, and in purity, li- living a pure life, uh, sinless life as much as you are able. Now, we all know we're, none of us are sinlessly perfect. We realize that. And we are striving for perfection in our lives. We're striving to perfect holiness in our lives. And yet, reality is we will all stumble. We will all fall. We all need the grace of, of uh, God in our lives. That's just the way it is. And so we work and we strive and we confess our sins and we, we overcome the temptations and we get stronger maybe the next time. But all of these things, Paul says, we need to be examples. Timothy, you need to be an example. I think it applies to you and me today too. I think we all need to understand that this can apply to our lives. Any thoughts about this uh, I really, I want to spend a little more time on it, to be honest with you. Word in word, what does that mean? I say it means what you say, everything you say, whether it be having to do with Christianity or teaching or what. What do you think? Do you have it there? Speech, Speech, okay, in your speech, okay. I think that's exactly what we're talking about here. The manner of life, that's your conduct, isn't it? That's the way you do things, whether anybody's looking or not. That's, we sometimes refer to that as characters, when you do what's right when nobody's looking. And that manner of life is something people are going to see that, and they're going to, have you ever been accused of being a Christian? Maybe one time or (laughs) twice in your life or something. That's the highest of compliments. When somebody says, you must be a Christian because of what you did, the manner of your life, what you were doing in your life impacted someone else enough so that they said something about it. And then what about this? What, what's next in there? In, my, in love, there is no getting around the significance of setting a good example. We've got to love one another from the heart. What? Fervently. Isn't that right? That requires, you've got to love me warts and all. It's not whether you like where I comb my hair. Well, I don't have to do, all I have to do is do that and I've combed my hair. But that doesn't matter. You've got to love me anyway. And I'm using me as an example because I realize sometimes I can be most unlovable. No amens from you, lady. That's just reality. I know, but you've got to love me anyway. You got to look for the good. You got to care. It's the agape, agapeos kind of love, the loving, having the best interests at heart, wanting what's profitable to you. That's the kind of love we have to have. And it ain't easy to do that all the time, is it? Oh, come on. Am I the only one? Alan. Randy Travis says, I'm not in love with your hair. Okay. I'm so glad. I'm so glad he's not, he's not in love with my hair. <laughs> uh, but this matter of exhibiting or demonstrating a proper example in love, it's going to show, it's going to be obvious. If you do something good for someone, something nice for someone, you don't do it to be seen of men, do you? You do it because it's the right and good thing to do. You do it because, frankly, doing right and good things and showing your love for others is as much a benefit to you as it is to them, maybe I sometimes more so. You're going to be blessed in the proving of your love toward your fellow man. Any other comments about example in love? So in word, in manner of life, in love, in faith. Stan? I was just reading a book, and it's a derogatory statement, but this person said that her friend joined up with the God Squad. 
Joined up with a God squad, yeah. It should be obvious. Yeah, it should be obvious. That's why I made that statement a while ago, if you've been accused of being a Christian, if it's happening more than once or twice, you must be doing a lot, something really good. Lamont, what are you thinking? As uh, Jesus uh, demonstrated, not only his love for, well, definitely demonstrated his love for mankind, but he also wants us to have a love of our enemies. Even, yeah. It is easy to love He's saying love not just your, your friends, but you love your enemies to follow the example of Jesus, don't right. you? Yeah, it does prove our, our true Christianity, doesn't it? If we love our fellow man, we'll even love those who don't love us. And, yeah. Yeah. Walking billboard, Thomas is saying, we need to make a choice to get out there and show our love or prove our love for our fellow man. Did I or? That's good. Okay. All right. And the word and, and then faith we mentioned. Did we, have I skipped one? And word, a manner of life and love and faith. Oh, and purity. Oh, my, my. We got to talk about it. You cannot live an impure life, whatever area or whatever aspect it is, and I'm not going to get into a lot of stuff, but if you do that, you're going to defeat your effort. You may, in fact, harm your fellow man or take away from them the privilege of seeing the example you set of, for good things, because if you're doing something impure and they know about it, that's going to pretty much nullify any good thing you might have been doing. Amen? Isn't that going to pretty, what, pretty much destroy it? I appreciate the involvement, too, by the way. Keep talking. That's a good thing. All right, look on, uh, let's see, number two. This is real important. You remember the story of Jesus uh, about washing the disciples' feet? That's the one in John 13, isn't it? And so what lesson was he trying to teach the disciples there? What do you think they were? I've got two ideas. What do you think? I think that's one of them, humility. Service is the other one. Those are my two. Now, there may be more, and you may have thought of, Mike, what are you thinking? You, 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 you're, you're good with that. Okay. I thought you sure did look like you were going to say something there. Okay. Anybody else? Jesus did the lowliest of tasks, the one that the least of the servants would have done. He made, uh, he made it clear that he was doing it because he wanted to. He chose to do it. He insisted when Peter said, not me, you know, Jesus insisted. And he showed humility. I think he showed the ultimate humility here, but he also showed that he was willing to serve. You've got to develop a servant attitude and being an example to others. Jesus was that way, wasn't he? I mean, that we just said he was. And so if we're going to be like Jesus, you be Jesus. You're going to be a servant, aren't you? You're going to do you're going to do the right thing. You're going to be showing a good example in every way. All right, where are we? Number two. Okay, let's look at number three. The question I got here is find at least one scripture, but I hope we can find more than one that tells of an example Christians should not follow. Which one do you think of? Demas. Demas okay. He hath forsook me not uh, no, having loved this present world, is that how it says it? Yeah. Demas was a good, bad example, wasn't he? Ananias and oh, yeah. Ananias and Sapphira. They were, had every right to hold all of that money, and yet they lied to the Lord, lied to the Spirit, and pretended they were giving it all when they were actually holding some of it back. Am I getting my story straight there? What does John, 3 John 11 say? I have it written down here. Anybody know? <laughs> Third John verse 11. 
Beloved, imitate not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth, doeth evil hath not seen God. Okay, who else might we, uh, what other scripture might we, we mentioned Acts, uh, Paul writing about Demas and Ananias Sapphire, what else, who else? Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer. The sorcerer. <laughs> well, you, you know what you put your coffee cup on. No, it's sorcerer. That's kind of hard to say for me. Yeah. He did. Paul had to rebuke Peter to his face because he was disassociating himself from the Gentiles when in fact he had gone and taught them uh, as the Lord had described. But when the Jews came around, Peter uh, did, a, did a different number, didn't he? All right, Sarah, what? Oh, Saul of Tarsus. Oh, he was a bad guy, wasn't he? That's a good, that's a good interesting way to uh, bring this uh, up about a bad example or uh, illustrate him where he shouldn't follow. Is he would, you wouldn't want to do what he did when he was, before he became a Christian, but after he became a Christian, he was as good of an example as we had, wasn't he? Like David. David was, yeah. Though a man after God own heart, God's own heart, yeah. King Saul, he was a bad example. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, he started out good. That's true. All right. Uh, what about Jude verse seven? Does that scripture tell us anything about? Ba oh, yeah. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, having in like manner with these given themselves over to fornication and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the punishment of eternal fire. They were a bad example, and we now know what happened to them, right? It's pretty clear, isn't it? What other verse of Scripture might we uh, meant where that tells of an example Christians shouldn't follow? Anybody? I've got some written down. That's why I keep having such brilliant rec recall here. What, what did you, Galatians 5, what, Andrew? 19, yes, <laughs> yes. Those works of the flesh uh, are obvious and they are to be left out of our lives. And like you say, we just do just the opposite and we'll be okay. To do any of those things, to follow the, any example of these sins would be detrimental to our spiritual health be wrong, of course, be unacceptable in the sight of God. And yes, that's an example you don't want to follow. Tish. Oh, yeah. Chapter 4, verse 2 of Philippians, Euodia and uh, Syntyche, they were encouraged to be of the same. Evidently, they were at odds with each other, right? Not a good example. Not a good example. Uh, any other? Jonah. Jonah was a, a good, bad example to start with, and then he did some right and good stuff, and then he got off track again. Jonah's an ups and down kind of guy, wasn't he? But yes, he was, uh, unfortunately, when he tried to run from God, that didn't work, did it? When he ran toward God, that was a good thing and did what God said. That was a good thing. Any other scripture that gives us an example of uh, that we shouldn't follow. There, I know there's others. Charlie, what you thinking? Oh. Right. You're severed from Christ, the American Standard has, yeah. And the, it's a falling away from grace, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's falling out of the good graces of God, if you will. Okay, any other thoughts? 
All right, look on, uh, let's see. Oh, this is an easy one. I shouldn't have even put this in here. Who besides Jesus gave us an example of suffering affliction and patience or endurance or steadfastness? Probably better choice of words there. Everybody ought to get that one now. Job's answer, isn't it? Job, Job was an example beyond comparison in some ways, wasn't he? How he endured what he endured, how he managed to hold on to his faith, or how I just can't imagine. I'd have been a basket case before I even got started good going through what Job went through. And I'm not putting myself down. I'm just saying I know how we are human beings. Job was an exceptional man. God knew it. God allowed him to be tested. And he proved himself to be steadfast and endure. And he's commended by James, James chapter 5, verse 11. What lesson can we learn from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, we read Jude, verse 7, a while ago not to give ourselves over to sin, and he names it specifically, fornication and unnatural lusts. What was going to be the result? What's the or else in that passage, Jude 7? Punishment of eternal fire. I don't want to be come on too strong here, but that ought to just make us quake in our boots, hadn't it? Just thinking about that. That, that, that. This should never even enter our minds to follow the example of those people of Sodom and Gomorrah. That should just repulse us, should turn us away from it. And if we, if we ever yield and give in to those kinds of sins, we'll suffer the punishment of eternal fire. It's pretty much a guaranteed thing, isn't it? All right, what else? Uh, number six, we already talked about that a little bit. Let me uh, do a couple of other things, and we'll leave this one, start at lesson two next time. But I want to share something with you that a famous man wrote, and he said everything, and then he mentioned someone, everything in him astonishes me. His spirit overawed me. His will confounds me. Between him and whoever else in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. He is truly a being by himself. Here, everything, in him, everything is extraordinary. Who do you think he was talking about? Jesus. He's the unique, one-of-a-kind, sinless Son of God. But the interesting part is you'll never believe who said this unless you're familiar with the quote. Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte. I would have never credited him with this if I had not read it somewhere else that somebody knew for a fact. I, I don't know that now. I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning whether he had, any, had faith because he obviously had some kind of faith, didn't he? But whether he was uh, involved in Catholicism, I don't know, Alan. All right? That's pretty interesting to me. Now, what would it have been like had you lived in the first century? What would you have seen? What would you have thought? What would you have known about Jesus in that time? Well, if you just saw him walking along down a road, you might not have thought anything about it unless he had a passel of folks around him listening to his teaching. But I'm talking about in that interim between 12 years of age and 30 when there's not a whole lot said. What if, he did, what if you'd have seen him? You might have had the attitude of some people, oh, he's just from Nazareth. There ain't nothing good coming out of Nazareth, right? That's kind of an attitude they had. And that, that of course, didn't describe Jesus, obviously. But what would you, if, if, if you had noticed his outward appearance, would there have been anything special about it? Anybody recall what Isaiah 53 Say it again. He had no comeliness. He grew up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. 
And so this Jesus that was, that's the whole focal point of our example, lessons on example, there was nothing about his appearance that would have drawn us to him. What about the clothes he wore? Well, probably nothing because they all wore about the same thing, didn't they? I mean, it's not like they had fashion designers back then coming up with the new, the latest in tunics. I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that was going on. So that would have not been anything that you would have noticed about him. Did they, were there any identifying signs? John was kin to him and said that I knew him not. Didn't mean he didn't know who he was, but he did not realize he was the divine son and would not have recognized him as such as the Savior except for divine revelation. This is my beloved son. Beyond physical appearance, what would we have seen and heard if we'd have been with Jesus? Well, now that's a good one. Besides the, the things that people so often focus upon, this was a man with such powerful uh, words that people would go for days without food listening to him to where he would finally take pity on them and feed 4,000 and 5,000 at once with little or nothing miraculously. He was a man of feelings. He was excitable. He was, uh, saw the need to cleanse the temple. He was moved with compassion on occasion. He was filled with pity, the scripture tells us. He was troubled, and it says he wept when his friend Lazarus died. He was a man, and yet he was a special man. He was grieved over unresponsive people, his own people. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, and he was just so unhappy that they would not accept him. And when he was in Gethsemane, the anguish that he experienced, the, the pain of his heart and the grief that he was experiencing and I think safely say even dread of what was coming. He knew what was going to happen. He was going to yield his will to the will of the Father but he was a real man because that anguish was genuine. The sweat as it were great drops of blood was real. That was some intense uh, feelings on his part. He made some extravagant claims. He said he was sent by the Father, claimed to be the Son of God, and yet this same man got tired, had to lay down and take a nap in the boat. You remember when the storm came up and he got up and peace be still. But the fact is, he was a real man. He got tired. And so you might not have even noticed except for the powerful words that he spoke, the perfect life, sinless life that he lived, and the claims that he made and the teachings that he offered. He was an exceptional, an exceptional man. All right, any other thoughts about our lesson tonight? All right, Steve. On your question, the Bible at least one scripture that tells us an example of which we should not follow, I was trying to think of verses that just kind of like what you gave us in Hebrews 7. Right. Right, yeah. There's not many of those there's not many of those in there though, are there? All right, lay it on us. Oh, okay, you hypocrites. All right. Yeah. <laughs> but not twenty three Matthew twenty three verse. Do not the works. Do what. Right. It's like a mother saying, "Do what I say, not what I do." That's not a good example, is it? Good. Well, it's a good point, but if they're setting a bad example, that's not good for the kid to, to see the bad example, is it? The daddy or the mother said. Do what I say, not what I do. Uh, unfortunately, that the the big example, the, the powerful teaching of that is the bad example. We don't want to follow that. Any other thoughts? Yeah, what you do, your actions speak louder than your words, don't they? Yeah, 
That's good. All right, all right, Stan, go. Whatever it is the life you live may be the only Bible somebody reads. The life you live may be the only Bible some people read. They'll see your example and learn from that. Oh, I've heard of stories like a person would live next door, they would invite a friend to church for years and to, uh, offer to study with them and no go, and, but they kept living a righteous, holy life, kept doing what they ought, and one day they said, I just have to go see what keeps them going. Denise? 2 Corinthians 5.20. 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are ambassadors for Christ. We're representing him. We're out there hopefully demonstrating what he would have us to do and showing a good example. Yeah, good point. Thank you so much for your involvement in the class.